Hi, so I'm Brooke Siegel. I'm the Director of Editorial Operations, which means that I oversee editorial strategy across all of Hearst digital sites. Um, and I think we should start with Eric Sullivan and just go around and say what you do at Hearst. Um, Eric Sullivan, I am Features Editor for Esquire.com. And I'm basically tasked with trying to figure out how to recreate those same kind of lush and beautiful features that you see in the well of your favorite magazines but in the digital space. I'm Jessica Pels. I'm the site director at Mary Claire. Um, what that means is that I'm in charge of all of our digital operations uh, for the brand. So the site, social, video, um, it's a lot and I love it. I'm Elisa. I oversee social media for Cosmo and Seventeen, which is like the most fun job in the world. I basically am a professional tweeter. Um, and I have a team of people that work under me. And I get to say things like, um, what's our strategy about Instagram all day long? <laughs> um, I'm Alyssa Fiorentino. I'm the social media editor at Delish.com. Um, and I manage our Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Snapchat, Pinterest, and Instagram. Uh so everyone, I think everyone mentioned their internships. So I think that's a good um, point, I'm sure, that it's of interest, uh, of saying how you got an internship, and or even more so, like how you would recommend that somebody goes about getting an internship now, as opposed to way, way back in 2013. <laughs> um, so right after college, I was living in Philadelphia. And doing clinical research, totally thought I was going to be a scientist, doctor. And um, my roommate at the time was the entertainment editor for the Metro, which uh, is both in New York and in Philly, and actually also in Boston and some cities around the world. And um, I begged her to allow me to write for her magazine because I wanted to go to free movies and concerts and everything. <laughs> and she said no for a very long time until she eventually said yes, that I could do one test article. And then, so through that process, I just sort of accumulated this set of clips. I didn't make any money from it. Um, they were small pieces that didn't get that much visibility, but I was able to build up a portfolio of work. Uh, little did I know it would later serve me down the line. So that when it came time for me to move on from thinking about being a doctor and switching careers entirely, I had this body of work that I produced that I could fall back on to, you know, to, to present and say, you know, this is something that I have a dedicated, passionate interest in. And um, that's how I got the Mother Jones internship. Um, you know, I think the probably the equivalent of that today is just tweeting a ton. Like, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you got your internship in the dark ages when dinosaurs roamed the earth. But um, no, but the thing is, like, for, for me anyway, everybody's different. But um, for me, the way I look at it is, everybody's contact information is online somehow, right? Like my email address is actually on our website. I get a lot of really funny, crazy emails. But um, if it's not an email address, it's a Twitter account that you can DM. Or um, if you know, like this is a really valuable trick that I hope you write down. If you know that where you're trying to get an internship is a company like Hearst, you can figure out that all Hearst email addresses follow the same format. So it's first initial last name at Hearst.com. So you can literally directly email the person you're trying to work for. I think that is really effective because it allows you to say something that not enough candidates say to me, which is, I love this brand. I care so much about what you do. I loved X thing you published last week. I read it every day. I would do anything to work here. Can I take five minutes of your time to do a quick phone call? Um, that's a way to, to leave a real impact. Yeah, I think uh, what you said too about loving the brand and knowing the brand, reading the brand is, is really key. It's a question I always ask everybody I interview. Um, so I work across all the sites, so I say, which sites do you love and why? And it stumps some people. So um, <laughs> yeah, so starting from there and being able to reference specific pieces, if you're you know, writing to pitch a features editor, acknowledge past features on Esquire.com that you read. Um, and just to also double down on the Twitter thing. Like, mm -hmm. if you have journalists or brands that you um, admire, follow them and be familiar with what they're saying. I also would say, like, these are, like, boring logistics things, but they'll help you. Like, for one thing, when I'm hiring people, I tend to read a lot of applications, like, on the train when I'm going back and forth to work. So, like, put your cover letter in the body of the email so mm -hmm. that, like, I can read it and I don't have to, like, load an attachment. Um, I would also say, like, in your subject line, it can be helpful, like, if you're applying for, like, um, 
you know, cosmopolitan.com summer internship, like dash Elisa Benson, like put your name in the subject because when I get internship application, like you know how your email and then it's like, how do I explain what I'm trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they all group together. So like that's just yes. like a really simple way that like all of a sudden your application that you spent a really long time working on might just get literally buried in someone's inbox because it's sorting with 25,000 other emails with the same subject. So I feel like making sure your subject, you know, that's just like a little teeny way to make sure that your, um, that your application is really getting looked at. And then the other thing, like what you guys were saying about like, talk about what you love about the brand. I think a mistake sometimes that young people make is that, you know, you guys are just starting out and your resumes aren't as long as like crusty old people like me and Eric and Brooke. <laughs> But um, you know, I am the oldest. Aren't long. So like, <laughs> I feel like the instinct is to sometimes talk about how experienced you are, but it's always like, just like assume that the person you're applying to is a total narcissist and that they want to hear about their brand. Like, don't talk about yourself. Talk about the brand you're applying to. I mean, kind of like dating. I think <laughs> Jess touched on this, but my not so secret secret to getting my internships, which were, it was. Two, it just the last two years. So I had a lot of people messaging me when I was at 17, like, oh my God, you have my dream job. Like, how did you do that? And all I did was cold email these people. And like you said, like I figured out their email and that was it. And I think if you send your resume to like internships at whatever.com, you're just getting dumped into a pool of like, like you're just getting lost. And um, another thing, this was crazy that happened to me the other day. I was on our Snapchat and I don't always open the snaps that we're getting because a lot of them are just like complete random stuff that I don't want to be seeing. Um, but a girl snap texted me and was like, oh my God, please tell me you're hiring. And so I just was like, oh, snap text you back. And I was like, um, we're always looking for interns. And she was like, unfortunately, I'm going to be graduating this May. And I was like, well, you know what? Send me your resume anyways. Like sometime we might have an opening. And just like that, like she made a connection, which I think is absolutely insane, like how you can make a connection through Snapchat now, like that that's the world we live in. And Another thing I would say is if you're really passionate about a brand, don't just follow that brand, follow its editors. Um, because we're always like Facebook making statuses or tweeting out like, hey, we're looking for interns. And like, you might miss our listing on Ed 2010, but you might see my tweet. And then you might be able to get the internship that way. Two more things I, I would add. Um, Elisa mentioned cover letters. And I think. I mean, you know, when I was coming out of school, it was a totally different environment, but um, you had to apply to a job with a cover letter, and it said, to whom it may concern, and it started with a paragraph about my experience and how I would be a valuable member of the team. Um, but I think, I think the more conversational you can be in these emails, the better off you are. If it feels formulaic, I might gloss over it, not because I'm not interested in you, but because it seems like you're not interested in us and that the kinds of content that we all publish, while we all have very different voices online, the internet is all about conversationality. It's all about directness. It's all about things that you can relate to and that you want to share. So if you send me a very stiff email, I won't necessarily see that in you, even if it's there. So I would surface. Um, sounding like a human and not like a robot. Um, and then the other thing is being associated with organizations like the one you're here with today. Um, Eric and I were both on the board of ASME Next, which is also a good group for um, young junior editors. Basically, if you're connected with a group like this, you're connected with people who have connections in the building. And if they feel strongly about you, they can email someone and say, you should really talk to this candidate because they're really smart and they care a lot about X brand. Um, so work your people connections, too. So <laughs> Eric, what qualities do you look for in entry level candidates? Um, well, you know, to the point that Jessica was making about trying to make yourself stand out as a candidate, um, I would just reiterate that because I think it's super, super important to, to make sure that in whatever communication you're having with uh, the person you're talking to, you really do let your personality shine because we can always tell if it's been a, a message that you've copied and pasted over and over and over again. And um, so to that end, so, you know, to, to reiterate, personality is key. In terms of, um, I mean, one thing that I'm very bad at is social media. I'm like really terrible. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but, uh, it is really, really important now. Like even though I'm not a great Twitter user and I don't have a whole lot of followers, 
every candidate that, that I look at and that all of my colleagues look at, we check Twitter, we check, I guess, Facebook occasionally, but mo I mean, mostly Twitter, right? Um, and Instagram. Instagram. And Instagram. And it's not to say that you need to have 10,000 followers and a little blue check next to your name. It just means that you need to be somehow engaged, you know, and there are ways that we can do that, and I'm not the person to talk to about how to engage. <laughs> uh, but there are certainly ways that you can engage uh, using these social platforms in ways with people in the media that you never would have been able to before, even five years ago. So, um, so if you have come to a job with an already established sort of like connection to the industry in some capacity, not necessarily the brand specifically, but just sort of a demonstrated public interest, that really stands out quite a bit. Um, you know, I, because I'm features, like I don't would never expect an entry level person to come in and having edited a, a bunch of features, right? Like that is just unreasonable expectation. But um, if they can talk to me about work that we've done, not just me, but Esquire as a whole, in terms of the ambition of our reporting and the quality of our writing, that will impress me. Basically, we are all narcissists. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, well, to build on something Eric was saying about social media, it's it's not necessarily like. Um, I know it's hard as an intern, as a student, to um, to weasel your way into a very competitive industry. That can be hard, just point blank. Um, I don't want any of you to feel like you have to have that kind of connection or presence on your social media in order to get hired. It's not necessarily about that. For, for us, I think it's more about your actual genuine personality because when you're working on online, who you are is what you bring to the office every day. Because like I said, our writing is personal. Um, we're writing quippy things that are conversational and funny in ways that, that we think are unique and special. Um, your interests are what I'm interested in because let's say you're really into books and you were the book geek at your college. Fantastic, we need a book editor so you can come in and do all of our books coverage. So what you're interested in is really important for us to see. Um, Okay, so you, you, we already talked about the resume getting in the door. Once you're there, I want to talk interviews. Um, maybe starting with some giant interview mistakes. Um, I was once an hour late to an interview. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, it was like, um, this was a million years ago, but uh, it was like in New Jersey, and I just like missed the bus to New Jersey, and they still offered me the job. Oh. Amazing. <laughs> I'm that good. No, I think they were really desperate. <laughs> No, um, don't show up an hour late. I don't recommend that. Um, people actually show up late to interviews all the time. All it's the time. so All the time. Yeah. Like, New York is a late city, but it's still, like... It's, especially if you're coming to a place like... Cur I mean, you should prepare with ample extra time anyway, but if you're coming to a place like Hearst, like, there's security at the front door. Like, there's a complicated elevator situation. I, that's actually true. You have to press the button before you get on and it trips people up. Um, and it could be hard to, like, and just once you're here, it could take 20 minutes. So yeah, don't be late. But also <laughs> don't get here too early okay. because, so the thing is you go to security and this is like at any major publishing brand, you go to security, you tell them why you're there and then they call up to the person that you're going to see and they say, I have so-and-so. Um, if I get that call 15 minutes before the interview is supposed to start, I'm like stressed out. I'm trying to finish editing a feature and getting five stories scheduled and like I, I need my time to get things done. Um, so I would say like do the security call up five minutes before. M my move is because the security guard, they're tell them that you're here for an interview. And uh, like, I'm here and I just want to check in and know how long it's going to take, but I don't want to call That's too soon. Idea. Like, be honest. That's a good well, idea. Well, you know. So my interview pet peeve is um, when people don't bring physical copies of their resume, <laughs> which um, like I know you emailed it to me, but I'm looking at you in person and I need something to read and, and more importantly something to take notes on so I can take it back to my desk and look at it and remember, oh, I thought she was really smart and she said that funny thing that I wrote down. So like, please, I know it's the digital age and we're all digital people, but like bring the resume with you. Uh, the only thing that I would say is don't ask trite questions. You know, I mean, like, you know, if you Google, you know, what question should I ask in an interview, they'll all be the exact same questions, and we all know those questions, and it just comes across as kind of lazy. And again, I think it speaks to a theme that you're probably seeing uh, throughout that you really want to tailor yourself and the conversation to whatever publication you are applying to. So you don't, um, you know, instead of asking, um, you know, 
what are some hardships that Esquire is facing? Like, how did you guys resolve them? Or something like that, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, ask me about um, a piece that we published last week that was talked about widely, um, either for better or for worse, and, uh, and how I think it went down and why. You know, and just sort of get my read on a specific situation as opposed to something more general. Um, or also, like, what has an intern done in the past that you've really liked? Or, like, your favorite intern, what did they do that I can replicate? I actually like it when people ask, like, what is something that an intern has done that's been really bad? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, like, I'm, yeah. People, we all like to talk about, like, horror stories. Oh, my gosh. Like, well, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're, we're running slower on time. So um, I wanted to go into opportunities that are actually available to Hearst Digital right now. And we had talked about the mix. Yes. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the mix, but it's designed exactly for you guys in mind. Um, if you go to the mix.hearst.com, you can sign up. And basically, it's an opportunity for people just like you that are starting out or maybe have some professional experience but not full-time jobs yet to, pit, to basically write for all of our websites. And you get paid for it. Um, and basically, you sign up. You get officially accepted. Um, and then there are stories that the editors are looking for, a list of stories that go out every day. Like, we're looking for a story about stolen identity at SoulCycle. So we're looking for a story about somebody who hated their um, engagement ring. We're looking for a story about somebody that paid their own way through college by doing something crazy. Like, every day, a handful of story ideas that go out, and people reply and basically say, yes, this is my life. I can write this. And then we pay you, and then it goes on all, all the websites. All the websites. I don't know why I said that like such an old person. I'm like, it goes on the internet.com. But um, so it gets published, and you guys get a clip. We get amazing content that we wouldn't necessarily have access to otherwise. But the mix.hearst.com, it's a really good opportunity for like literally everyone in this room. So true. I was going to ask Alyssa about um, internships, but I feel like we talked on that plenty. Um, and so I want to ask you about the environment at Hearst. Um, or like what the office culture is like. I I feel like I had such like a unique internship experience because I literally stayed in this building. I like came in and ran around like a little rat in the right, building. You don't have rats, so. um, but like, <laughs> literally stayed here. Um, but I went from Seventeen.com, which was a small team. I want to say like six people at the time when I was there, and then I went to Cosmo.com, which was like. A, we were in on 35, and how many yeah. people were there? Like 30? Yeah, probably. So that was like a really different. I felt like, you know, not everybody knew my name, but like, and I did. And I feel like, like you said, you regret not engaging with everything that was going on. Like at Cosmo, there was so much going on that I couldn't pay as much attention to everything. It was just like doing the task at hand. Um, but everybody was super nice. Um, then I went to harpersbazaar.com, which was back to another smaller site, so seven people. And that was where I really learned how to pay attention to what everyone was doing. Like I sat next to the beauty editor and I noticed what she was doing and I helped the fashion editor and I noticed what she was doing. And that was when I realized kind of like what I wanted to do. And I was like, the only thing I'm really ready to do right now is social media. Um, but everybody's super helpful. And I think I got my internship at Cosmo because after, like at the end of the 17 internship, the editors were like, what do you guys want to do next? And I was like, oh, well, I would really like to go to Cosmo. And they were like, here's somebody's email. And um, one of the editors was like, who did you interview with? I'm going to email her right now and tell her to accept you. And like, I got that job. And so it's just like, like I said, if your attitude is right, I think everybody will treat you back with that same kindness. Um, and, and it can be intense coming in this building and intimidating. You go through security, like you have to learn the elevator system. But once you get past that and like you get your interview done, I think you're all good. Um, and now after that, I was on Women's Day, which was literally three people. And now I'm on Delish, which is growing and growing. I would say we're like, I think we're like seven full time right now. And we are close as can be, it's kind of disturbing, um, <laughs> super tight, uh, which I think is so amazing to like, and I think if you, you're interning on any of these teams or anywhere you intern, if you can like, you know, don't be obnoxious and like act like you're already part of the group, but if you can like speak up and be mm -hmm. part of the conversation, that's better than sitting there like a wallflower. I second that, like if you have an internship or entry level, like make an impression, be involved in the conversations that are happening beyond just what your day to day is. Like be interested, be engaged, um, because the people that you remember really stand out. And like I have people that I worked with ten years ago, and I, I like and that stuck with me. And now I will like work to get them a job. 
Like I will absolutely advocate for somebody that made an impression, and sometimes making an impression just means like getting noticed. Um, to that point, can I? Can I? I have to embarrass Mara Santilli, <laughs> who is um, our intern at MaryClaire.com right now. She's sitting right here in the red sweater, um, and Mara is fantastic. One of the best interns I've ever had, and I'd like to tell you why. Um, it's partially because she's an amazing writer, um, which goes a really, really long way on a website. Interns absolutely get a chance to write a ton. Oh my so, God, so uh, much. Like, <laughs> I, I literally assigned you, what, 12 stories? <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Um, so interns get to write a ton here, which is really cool. Um, but Mara is amazing because she's a fantastic writer. Also, um, she knows the site really well. So what I mean by that is not just what we're publishing and what we've done already, so let's look forward, but like, who are we? What are we trying to say? What's our angle? Mara just sort of understands that implicitly. But maybe the best takeaway for you guys is that she's a problem solver. Um, so the waitress story. Um, Waitress the Musical. Um, Mara pitched a story about Waitress the Musical, which is this new story, uh, new um, Broadway show. Um, and I thought it was a great idea. Yes, let's do it. Let's work with our entertainment booker to try to get an interview um, with the cast. And that didn't work out. And what I got from Mara was not like, oh, I don't, I don't know how to. I couldn't get an interview, like what should I do? What I got from Mara was I couldn't get an interview that way. So instead I reached out directly and now I have an interview set up for Friday and I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z and um, I'll have it turned in on Monday. Um, the, the point of which is like, if you can come to me and say there was a problem and I fixed it, um, that's a really, really powerful tool to make you one of my favorite people. I mean, the truth is like, if, even if you feel like we're not paying attention to you or like anything like that, but we need interns more than you understand. Like I feel like our site couldn't function without an intern and like it's it's a fast paced environment, but if you can adapt to that and if you can do what we ask with a smile on your face, I feel like that is just so huge. Um, um, that is the time for the panel down to the second. <laughs> um, uh, we did it really. <laughs> Put right in there. Um, so I don't know if there's any like official way to open up to questions or if I just. Hi guys, thank you for chatting with us today. My name is Chelsea and I went to Hunter College. Um, my question is more specifically for you, Jessica. You said that um, when you're reaching out to someone, you should like let your personality shine through. So in that regard, like to what extent do you encourage being creative like in your approach? Because I know sometimes like some jobs require a resume and then a cover letter. And I know like someone sent a video where it was like they were describing their experience. So like to me, that was like a really cool way of like, I don't know, showing their personality. So like, do you encourage that at all? Like breaking out of like the conventional? I definitely do. I don't want a cover letter in like haiku form. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I think it's specific to the brand. So like if I'm in your shoes and I'm trying to work at Cosmo, I'm gonna be like way more fun and outgoing and I would totally do a video and I would show them some social skills and I would be fun and funny. Um, a brand like Mary Claire is like a little more serious and a little bit older. So while I would have personality, I would still, it's basically just match the tone of the site, or, or rather the digital presence. So um, delish, you'll want to maybe em embed some Instagrams of food you've made in your email. Um, for Esquire, you'll maybe want to be a little snarky? No? Sassy? Uh, little yeah, sassy? Sure. Um, so basically match the tone of the site that you're going for. But creativity totally will help you stand out. I just think like if I got a snap text, I would be like, not for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Hi, I'm Sai and I go to Fordham. I'm gra graduating in May, so woo, <laughs> Um, I'm in this process now of looking for a job and I'm interested also in social media and marketing and branding for millennials and fashion, spirituality, that kind of industry and realm. And a lot of positions that I'm noticing are asking for salary requirements and that's not really something that I've thought about because it's coming more from a place of passion and that just me being genuinely interested in the job and cultivating the craft so should I just skip over that part and express more my interest with the brand, or should I round up or down? Well, what first do you of all, always a ram. 
Second. Um, <laughs> always a what? Always a ram. Your rams. Thank um, <laughs> I, absolutely not. First of all, I mean, like, I'm not going to give you a number to throw out there. I'd say, you know, call your mom or dad or grandma or whoever you got. That's what I did. And I was just like, Dad, what do I say? Um, and I think they'll give you a, a great, a great, like, point to start with. But I would always, I mean, round up, shoot for the stars. And don't I'm gonna, play yourself short, I would say. I'm going to jump in just, um, and I would say that you should absolutely skip it when you can. I totally agree always, always skip it. Um, some sites now when you're applying online won't let you and you have to fill it in. Um, in that case, I would um, always round up. Um, and uh, I would do, there's tons of great tools out, out now like Glassdoor that show what salary ranges for certain positions are. So go in educated, um, round up if there's a place to say you know, that you're open to negotiation and then always negotiate, always, always. It is not, I, I, people worry that like it would rub someone the wrong way or a hiring manager, but if someone doesn't negotiate with me, I worry that they don't know their worth. And that doesn't, that could be 5%, you know, but, um, and you might not get it, but I think that realizing like, and, and to come back with, I'm so excited and passionate about this job and I absolutely can't wait to work here. I was thinking because of X, Y, and Z and give the examples um, that, you know, this is more in line with what I was thinking salary wise. Um, but that conversation is always, you know, open. So skip it so that you're not the first one saying it. If you can't skip it, research it. And then once you get an offer, just negotiate. When I left my job at Women's Day, um, I, I was a very open dialogue with my boss because she was the one who told me that there was an interest in me. Um, she... I, I was like, do I negotiate? Can I ask you a question? And she was like, always, always negotiate. And she told me that I could have negotiated with her for my salary at that job. And I, because I didn't, she didn't give me the extra amount of money that she had for me. And I was like, thanks for telling me that now. <laughs> when you are hiring someone, you have a range. You have a range to work with. Um, so... Uh... Yeah, you want to shoot for the high end of that. Yeah. Right, like they're expecting you to negotiate. Yes. That's sort of the point. Right, and sometimes you can't. Like sometimes like it's like, no, this was my cap and that's what I offered and there's nowhere to go, but I'm never going to be like, and harumph, like I can't believe you asked. So. And if it's for a job, like you said, that you're really passionate about, you're going to know that no matter what the number is, you're going to want that job. If it's a job you're not so passionate about, you know, you might pass on it depending, but yeah, I say if you're passionate, you know, negotiate when you can and take what you get. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Marie. I'm actually a grad student at the New School, and I know that all of you guys are writers. I consider myself more of a content creator. Do you guys have any experience of, um, you know, looking at video resumes or video cover letters? Oh, yeah. I feel like that is definitely my forte, and um, what do you guys think? think about that and if you suggest that. I think that makes you super duper valuable right now because the thing is we can't just be writers. We can't just be writer editors. Um, we like I spend maybe 10% of my day photoshopping stuff. Um, we shoot videos on the fly, so my, my film degree does come in handy, Dad. Um, but uh, so we all have to, by virtue of operating, you know, digital properties that exist across so many different platforms, we have to create content in all different kinds of ways. And I think people who can write and edit and do video and do graphics and do Photoshop, like those are the most valuable people, I think, going forward. So. Um, like, good on you for having those skills. And I think if you guys can all also develop, take a Photoshop class. Like, while you're still in school, try to take some design classes, get a sense of, After like, Effects. After Effects, for sure. Um, We're always looking for people who have After Effects. Problems. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, I think you're set up really well. Hi, my name is uh, Vito from Bentley University. Uh, specific question for Eric. So what's your mindset for a career change being a neuroscience into a writer? I mean, I'm, I'm originally a, a marketing science uh, student where I learned all this, I work in the data, data analytics, but now I'm working towards copywriting. And I know it's like two months left for, until like graduation and my, my parent thinks I'm crazy because you, know, you have two years of data analytics and you're going to copywriting right away. So what's your mindset? So like how, how do you keep yourself motivated to like working towards, you know, being a writer rather than, you know, and dropping all this, uh, near, you know, all the, 
all these things that you learn from school, basically. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that when I was going into it, like I said, my parents were horrified. And, um, you, you know, they were, uh, the way I alleviated that was I was like, oh, you know, like maybe I'll be a science writer or like <laughs> maybe I'll work at a science magazine. And, like, there was no chance that I was going to do that. I wanted nothing to do with science whatsoever, and I still have residual effects. Like, I, you know, PTSD from the whole experience. That's so funny. Um, which is to say that you should not you know, feel bad about walking away from data analytics altogether. And that, you know, the way I've always looked at it is that I'm now doing something that I truly love and I can't regret anything that I did leading up to this, right? So, you know, I studied science for four years and then did clinical research for two years after that. And that was a huge amount of my life that I dedicated to that. And I look back and I'm like, oh, you know, I wish that I was an English major, I wish I was a film major, whatever. But like, you know, you just have to sort of move on and you don't have to feel like, you know, what you've learned as a data analyst needs to apply to what you're doing next. It's okay. Although it could. Of, yeah. I mean, I data, seriously. We yeah. live in data land online. Yes. So. Um, we use a ton of data tools and like the more that we could um, understand them, the better. So I think it's an asset. Also, I interview a lot of people and, um, you know, a lot of people, their background is, uh, you know, English or journalism, or and when I meet someone who has a different background and made a shift, that's always really interesting. Um, so I would actually play it up. I mean, you're switching to something because you're passionate about it, and um, to see that passion is, and you have an interesting backstory, and you're not another, you know, person that I'm meeting with the same major. So I actually think it could be a big asset. So I wouldn't worry about it. Thank you. Um, Hi, my name is Chantel Risher. I'm a senior at St. Francis College and I'm a communication arts major. Um, my question really is, do you, for any of you guys, do you have any advice for someone who wants to strengthen their writing? Because I always thought that I was to get an internship at a magazine in order to learn from the employers that work there about strengthening with writing because for me, um, I did little work with like newspaper writing but I'm more of a videographer and video editor. Um, so what advice do you have for someone like me? Uh, well, I um, occasionally will take, and I still do this actually, I, I'll take a magazine story that I love. And I'm talking about like the top 0.01% of stories out there that I just, you know, the stories that bring me to tears. And um, I will either sort of sit down and think, uh, you know, what about the story do I love and what are the mechanics of the piece, you know, what is the narrative arc, whatever, yeah. That stuff you probably have already done in plenty of classes, but I like to sometimes um, like type the piece and just sort of look at the text on one side of the screen and have a Word document on the other. And myself, just through the process of typing out the language, I find, at least for me, that it sort of gives me insight into the story that I never would have had, you know, no matter how long I talked about it with somebody else, no matter how long I thought about the mechanics of it. So. That is something that I find particularly useful. And also just, you know, the sort of the greater context there is just read great shit. I mean, there's so many great magazine <laughs> stories out there, um, so much great writing out there, and just know where to get it and just constantly be reading read it. it. And not just reading it, but thinking about why it's great. I know but that's also, fair, but. that's a really cool technique, by the way. I want to do Thank that. Thank you. Um, I also think, like, those are... If, if you're a writer, those kinds of stories will not make up the bulk of what you do every day. The bulk of what you do, as far as our sites are concerned, is news or a beauty trend story or a gallery. And part of what will help you be a better person to do that is um, discipline about writing. So like, I was really precious about writing when I first started as an intern. I would sit down and think, like, how can this be the best thing it can possibly be? And then I would beat myself up about it for days. And um, it was just a torturous experience that did not yield good writing, let me tell you that. Um, so if I were you and I didn't have a dedicated outlet like an internship, I would set up a blog, not to say it has to be any kind of public facing thing, but I would just set up a blog for myself and I would put myself on a schedule. So I have to write one story every Saturday and I have a couple of hours to do it. Like that is a very valuable writing skill that I think a lot of people underestimate. Um, and then the other thing aside from reading a lot of great stuff is listening to people talk. Um, one of the things that I think green, inexperienced writers exhibit more than anyone else is a lack of sense of rhythm. And Eric and I both come from print, and I think 
do you talk about rhythm with writers? We talk about rhythm a lot, I think partially because print emphasizes that because there are space limitations, but like a great piece has to have a great rhythm and it has to have a nice kicker and it has to have a flow and you have to have sort of a long sentence and then a staccato sentence. And um, for me, that all came from theater actually, but from like listening to people talk. And I just want to add, and I'll kick it over to Alicia for this, is about packaging. So this is the internet. A lot of it is how you package a story. People read headlines, they scan them quick, and our job is to, in that short space, grab you and get you on the site and then to stay there. So if you want to talk a little about that package process. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think when we say like the way something is packaged, it's like there you can write a million stories about dating, but like how are you packaging it? What makes this feel different? Um, and I don't know. I think working in social media made me really good at that because you read an entire story that editors spent hours and hours and hours writing, and you're literally trying to like put it out into the world in 140 characters. And so that makes you really good at sort of zeroing in on like the nugget of the story that is like compelling to the audience. And I think something we talk a lot about at Hearst across the board is sort of like working backwards from that. Like, how is this going to be presented on social um, and letting that drive the way the story is like packaged or positioned. But yeah, I think like everything you guys said, but just like read all the time and also like subscribe to magazines, which is like only costs like $5. And like, <laughs> you know, then you have a steady stream of like amazing things coming to you like on the regs, if you guys even like know what mail is. <laughs> you might have already like looked into this, but see if your school offers a writing class. I took a writing workshop and like this professor hammered home that your first paragraph should only be 30 words or you're like your intro and like every single assignment we handed in like you could only write 30 words in the, the intro and like that was something that really helped me with my news writing at Women's Day so see if that's possible. Uh, hello my name is Philip Richardson and I am a grad student at CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, my question, I think Alyssa sort of hinted toward it a little bit earlier about impact and sort of the experience that you had on the bus uh, with uh, the young lady reading the, the article that you wrote. Um, so I wonder for everyone, how do you uh, measure your impact, mm. maybe perhaps outside of typical metrics like page views, and how does that shape your editorial process? That is a very emotional. smart question. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I'll start. So. Um, for me, it's important to contrast the ways print measures success versus digital. So, you know, I've worked in print for five years, and in print, you spend months working on a story, and you have the luxury of time to do that. And, you know, everybody on the team gets really behind it, and you package it up, and you send it off to the printer, and you send it off to the world, and you're like, oh, I did a job well done. And your success, honestly, is measured by the fact that it ended up in the magazine to begin with, and that your colleagues in the office told you that it was great, right? Um, there was a time when magazine, print magazines had more of an influence, uh, such that they would actually be conversation drivers, and they still can, obviously, you know, and I love print products. I don't mean to disparage them at all, but in this day and age, you know, a print product, a, print, a story that ends up in print really doesn't matter until it goes online just because of how people share and, and talk about stories. So when I moved to digital, now everything is about the unique page views. Everything is about how long somebody's staying on a particular story. And so second by second, you can track exactly how well your story is performing with the audience it was intended for. And I am still learning that and getting new used to that, and I'm fascinated by it, and I think it's incredible. And so I, you know, I'm still at the stage where I measure my success by the metrics you're, you know, the metrics that you guys are probably all used to looking at and studying. Um, I think it's amazing, but you know, the, you know, then you look, you start looking at Twitter conversations and you start looking at Facebook conversations, and you know, if you get an email from a friend of a friend about the story, like those kind of things, like make a make it sort of a more personal sort of satisfaction, but I still am fascinated by unique views. I don't know about you guys. Well, and also like, concurrence, how many people are reading a story at the same time, how long they stay on it, how engaged they are, to just go to that print digital, like to get that real-time feedback that people are invested in something I, I just either created or assigned or wrote um, is, I think, so rewarding. When I was um, studying up for my interview with Troy Young, who's our um, fearless leader at HDM, Hearst Digital Media, um, I read in an interview that he said, you know, the amazing thing about my team and about digital people is that they don't sit around in a room and say, oh, that story was really great. They sit around and they say, oh, that story did really well. Um, 
which resonated with me for a lot of reasons. And the super satisfying thing, like when you hear the angels sing and you're like, this is the right thing to do, is when a really great story does really well organically and you're like, bad words I won't say, like yes. Um, but your question was brilliant and also points to the fact, something that we haven't addressed at all, which is that online we really do um, I don't want to say live and die by numbers, but they're really important to us because we have access to them. And the more readers you can reach with the content that you're spending money and working hard to make great, the better off you are as a company. So um, metrics certainly matter. And actually, I mean, uh, I forgot to address the second part of your question, uh, which is does that affect the editorial decisions that we're making? Oh, yeah. And. Um, Absolutely, 100%. But I think that there was a time when, five years ago when I entered the industry, when I was like, okay, like, you know, digital is the death of good journalism. You know, it's just we're going to devolve into this place where everybody is just like it's studying so Twitter to follow. Like, you know, it's like nobody wants to read a story longer than 140 characters ever, you know? And we have been extremely pleasantly surprised over the last, you know, two, three years to find that. If you invest the time and resources into a story, if it's a, even if it's a digital-only story, readers respond well to that because maybe they're not used to seeing a story like that on other websites they look at. You know, and if you, as a digital property, are willing to create these big, ambitious pieces, your readers trust you on that journey and will follow you down there. So um, that's why my job exists at all. I mean, you know, I'm not sure if three years ago Hearst had a features editor that was digital-only, but now they have a ton of them because. Yeah. You know, this is this is sort of the next phase of, of online operations. Um, so, oh, and so yes, it does drive my editorial. <laughs> so I do think about, you know, it's like, do I think about the stories that I want to tell differently? Like, yeah, but it's in a, it's frankly good. You know, it's like, okay, like this story is really important, and uh, I want to tell it, but how can I tell it in a way that will engage with an audience immediately and have immediate impact? And that I don't see as a bad thing. Yeah, I always tell my team, like, you know, first of all, I think it's fun to, like, live and die by the numbers. Like, that motivates you. You know, like, when you know instantly that no one cared about this political story that you wrote because everyone is clicking on, you know, Kim Kardashian selfie, like, I actually, some people feel discouraged by that, and I feel really, like, motivated. Like, that's an insight into our audience, and, like, we need to serve them better. But I tell my team all the time, I think it's so important to do things that have nothing to do with the metrics and just, like, bring us joy. And an example of that, and, like, Cosmo's Instagram a few weeks ago, like, I don't even know why, but we just, like, thought it would be really funny to post 24 photos of Leonardo DiCaprio yes. in a row um, leading up to the Oscars. Yeah, and it was, like, people, it was so good. Yeah. It was mesmerizing. Yeah, I and we just, like, we storyboarded it out. Like, we had our 24 pictures of Leo. We were, like, this is the order. Like, the comments were, like, has Cosmo been hacked? Like, <laughs> like but I was just like, this is everything. Like, it's all that matters. It's so important to the world to make this contribution. And Kate like, loved that. <laughs> Kate told me that she loved that. Well, that was kind of a funny thing. Is like, we did it because we were like, LOL. But it turned out there was actually a really positive response in the company. And like, I have friends at other magazines that were like, that Leonardo DiCaprio, like, exhibit on your Instagram. <laughs> I was like, ah. Oh. But, um, and then we did something similar a few days later where we just thought it was really funny to pull like images of skeletons. That was hilarious. I and love like that. write funny captions. And yeah, like, you know, I just think that really matters. Like you should love your job and laugh and have fun and like weird ideas lead to brilliant ideas. Yeah, I guess for me, as far as impact goes, like you said earlier and we've explained Delicious Fairly New, I think we relaunched March 2015. Um, so for me now, if I see somebody on my news feed, like from high school who I haven't talked to in like, what, six years, like share a delish video, I'm like, ha, gotcha. Like, I love to see <laughs> random, random people on my feed sharing our videos and sharing our stuff. And I'm like, do they even know that I work at delish? Like, do they know? They don't realize. So, I mean, that makes me feel like I'm having an impact personally. <laughs> um, I think that is our time. So... Yeah, I don't know if anyone. So, okay. <laughs> that is our time. Thank you. Bye.